Hi everyone, welcome to Conversations with Miss T, and that is me. I am having a conversation with Aloisi Urasa. Aloisi is currently based in Tanzania. He is a health laboratory scientist, a chairperson of African Leaders Malaria Alliance, and also Alma's Youth Advisory Council. Guys, thanks again for tuning in, and I hope that you will enjoy this. Oh, what are you drinking? I guess I, I guess have my Kilimanjaro water. Ah, <laughs> it's a pure drinking water. <laughs> you but it is tapped sick. from the from the longest mountain in Africa. Oh, cool! Nice. Does it That's have Kilimanjaro? Like, does it give you some superpowers or something? Actually, it gives me a lot of energy. <laughs> Are you just making this up? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. All right. So you wore a suit for me. Thank you. Mm, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how are you feeling now? You still nervous? Um, I'm not. I'm okay. Okay. You are 23. You don't look 23, which is a compliment, by the Re way. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I look older. You look more mature. You look like you know what you're doing with your life. No, thank you very much. Yeah. Do you know what you're doing with your life? Yeah. Do you know what you're doing with your life? I really, I can say I know. Okay. Um, so do you want to introduce yourself? All right. So... Um, my names my names are my name is Alois Paul Urasa. I'm a fresh graduate, a health laboratory scientist, currently doing my internship in Northern Refer Hospital in Tanzania, uh, known as Kilimanjaro Christian Medical uh, Center. I'm also a chairperson of African Leaders Malaria Alliance Youth Advisory Council and also a country director for the World Youth Summit and the Next Generation Global Health Security. I also serve in the community as a volunteer uh, through the community based in, uh, based in church, uh, known as Santa Gidea Community. Mm -hmm. So that's briefly about me. Yeah. Um, do you have any siblings? Yeah, yes, I have uh, three. I'm the first one. So I have three, yeah, two young brothers and one young sister. Okay, you guys get along? Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is like, uh, I'm sorry, I know I'm probably just throwing you off, right? It just came to mind. What is, what is the specialty between your siblings? Like, you know, you know, like every family has that one person that is good at this and good at that. So what are you good at? And what are your siblings good at? Okay, for me, I'm the first one and I'm good at public speaking and I love a lot of public speaking and leadership. Since I was very young, I used to serve from the church as a leader at school. I used to be a head boy, we call head prefect from the school. So I'm good at, in leadership and public speaking. The second one is currently a second year university student, very good in drawing and is currently doing architecture, a BSc in architecture. Nice. The, th the third one is in high school now, is a very good uh, in tempering with things, you know, like a uh, good mechanical engineer, you know, yeah. but currently he's in high school, or I'm in high school currently. And the youngest one, I'm not very sure what she is good in, but she does a lot of things, but she says she loves mathematics. Okay. So I don't know. Is she good and at it too? She's just tempering with everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. Yes. Now, when we when we spoke the other day, um, you told like I was, and and this just made me realize how ignorant I've been. Um, I was so shocked that malaria is still a problem in in most countries, uh, yes. well, in some countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I introduce myself, I'm currently a chairperson of the Youth Advisory Council at African Leaders Malaria Alliance, and our main objective is to advocate for youth engagement in the fight against malaria. Mm -hmm. uh, before joining the African Leaders Malaria Alliance as uh, in the Youth Advisory Council, I was a youth. I've, I was and I'm still serving as a youth ambassador for the Malaria Normal UK, where we were uh, developing some campaigns against malaria. I've also served as a youth leader for health. Uh, we are trained in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, 
in the areas of ad advocacy in health system strengthening, and particularly in fighting against malaria. Uh, why I chose all this path to uh, engage in the fight against malaria is because after joining a medical school as a health laboratory sciences student, I started learning a lot of things about uh, the diagnosis patterns of malaria. I learned a lot about uh, the clinical parts of malaria, how it affects the population. And then I went further into the epidemiologies of malaria. And one of my studies at, uh, at the university was on malaria. I was trying to study about the malaria gametocytes, how it, it is transmitted, and what we can do to, bl to block the transmission. Mm -hmm. So I learned that malaria is really a problem in many parts of uh, of the world and particularly in Africa where the prevalent, the most prevalent species of malaria is uh, Plasmodium falsparum, which is, uh, uh, which takes people to severe illness and uh, causes more deaths globally. And uh, the data of malaria in 2019 was uh, from the WHO showed that uh, over 400 uh, a thousand people died just because of malaria. And it was uh, very alarming to me that in every two minutes, we used to lose one child under the age of five because of malaria. And the more alarming report uh, from WHO this year, which is even exacerbated with uh, the impacts of COVID-19, is mm -hmm. that we are currently losing one child in every minute under the age of five because of malaria. And the increase, uh, the numbers uh, of death uh, due to malaria increased by 12 percent we moved from about 500 something and now we are into 600 um, 600 000 plus uh, malaria deaths and um, in the sub-saharan parts are more affected with malaria so that's why i'm really embarking on it and i can tell you uh, malaria is still a problem in many parts of africa back to you yeah you said there was a 12 percent increase what what course what course that you mentioned something about COVID 19 can you just like kind of break it down for me um, what are the factors that led to the increase in in the infection with malaria? Okay, I can see. Uh, yeah, malaria needs a a, a very sustainable or consistent. Uh, uh, interventions. When okay. you're fighting malaria, that means you have to deal with the environment, you have to deal with the people, the uh, social behavior changes in the communities, you have to deal with uh, diagnostic techniques, how you diagnose malaria, how you treat malaria into the clinical aspects of it. And during the COVID-19, a lot of uh, health systems were really, uh, were really fragmented. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of gaps in uh, health financing systems, and there was a lot of demand due to the impact of COVID-19. So maybe I can say health systems were uh, somehow overwhelmed and mm -hmm. some uh, attention was divided. Like we have to fight malaria, we have to fight COVID-19, and COVID-19 had heated a lot of heads, uh, like everyone was speaking about COVID-19. So in many parts, perhaps people forgot to speak about malaria, forgot mm -hmm. to talk about cleaning, uh, uh, clearing the, uh, cutting the grasses short, uh, fighting the, uh, eliminating mosquito breeding sites. And most of the people uh, we shifted into uh, COVID-19 prevention, uh, uh, prevention uh, interventions. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, social distancing. And social distancing. There are issues yeah. with malaria. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, you just answered my next question. So my next question was, because you mentioned something about um, eradicating you know the possibility of the infection um environmentally so i was just going to ask like what what do you do what is the process and you said um you know you can you know trim the grass and what else just say it again for me please uh, okay so as i said malaria uh, is spread through uh, uh it's a mosquito borne disease right right uh, so to fight malaria we must fight the vector which is carrying this uh parasites to human beings. Mm -hmm. So to fight this uh, vector, that is the mosquitoes, uh, we must fight where they can breed, where they can reproduce right. and grow to infect the people. So that's mm -hmm. why we need to conserve the environment. And another thing we have to do is to strengthen health systems so that those people who are already affected with malaria can be uh, thoroughly treated and uh, get cleared so that they cannot uh, retransmit this uh, disease to the community. Another thing we need to do is to uh, to ensure that people are well educated and understand the importance of using uh, mosquito nets 
uh, okay. treated mosquito nets um, mm -hmm. and we recommend more the long lasting insecticides treated mosquito nets for the community to use and another intervention is to use the bio larvicides that is uh, bi biological chemicals that are used to to ensure that we uh, we stop the breedings in the breeding sites identified uh, breeding sites mm -hmm. and uh, those are also another method we can use the insecticide uh, residual spraying, indoor residual spraying, IRS uh, in short form. Yeah. That is spraying through the doors to ensure that uh, mosquitoes which have uh, uh, around the, uh, the the houses are, are, are cleared. Right, right. And also investing more in research and development as a key to identifying these uh, areas, the species, and, the, and coming up with new, new technologies to fight the, uh, the disease. Yeah, and so far, we there are two well-known species, right? That are um, two species of mosquitoes that cause malaria, right? You mentioned one, and what, what is the other one again? Um, when you're talking about species, we are not talking about the mosquito species. We are talking about the parasites, ah. the parasites, the plasmodium okay. species. Uh -huh. So what causes malaria is the plasmodium. Okay. But uh, out of the plasmodium, we have specific species. We have about five species okay. that uh, cause malaria. And I can mention a few of them. One is the plasmodium falsparum, which is right. affecting most parts of Africa. We have plasmodium vivax, plasmodium malaria, plasmodium ovale, and another one <laughs> we have forgotten. I can it's mention the four for now. At least you know four. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know any. <laughs> Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, so now yeah, but all these are carried by uh, a mosquito vector. We call it a, more. It's a female Anopheles mosquito. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, uh, it's a mosquito which carries these uh, uh, th these parasites. Yeah. And transmit them through bites. Yeah. Okay. So then, yeah. what happens? So you get a mosquito bite. Um, you know, the parasite is in your body. Can you just take me through that process? So it goes through what your blood, your veins. How does how does it work in your system? Okay, so when you get yeah, so briefly, when a, a mosquito which uh, carries the parasites uh, bites you, the it gets uh, its saliva which carries the the parasites to the to the blood system, and it takes some time to circulate through your blood before you get ill, before you get uh, you start experiencing the symptoms such as headache, nausea, or uh, maybe dizziness, uh, dizzy, and so on before you experience these symptoms. So when the parasites get uh, to the blood system, before they go to the liver, for some time, uh, there's a, a very scientific process through that. After moving from the liver, then they, uh, they are released to the blood systems and starting to cause infection now. And when they're circulating through your blood, then an when another mosquito, which is uninfected, bites you, then it carries again the gametocytes, mm -hmm. the eggs of this uh, of these parasites, and then the cycle continues to developing through the mo uh, the mosquitoes gut, and after there it goes to infecting other people. Yeah, because you mentioned something about retransmission, and I wasn't sure what you meant about that, but now I get it. Which part yeah, of yeah, your yeah. which part of your bodily system does does the parasite cause to shut down? Is it the circulatory yeah. system, or which uh, sorry, part? is it the circulatory system? Is, I remember yes, from my it's biology blood class. circulation. <laughs> okay, good. <Yeah. laughs> I was about to mention yeah. the systems that I remember from my biology class. Respiratory <laughs> system, yeah. skeletal system. Okay, let's not go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the they were talking about the circulatory system. Okay. The and, circulation. Oh, okay. And and what happens? Does the does the parasite reproduce in, in your body? Like what what happens? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, when you when you get this uh, infection, there's a replication of these parasites in your blood through the. It infects the red blood cells, mm -hmm. and they depend on the red blood cells on the oxygen that is within your red blood cells to to grow. So when in your in your uh, in your circulation, blood system circulation, they can keep on reproducing more and more. Mm -hmm. So that's where that, that's where you can get uh, if someone is untreated. The severity increases due to the over uh, reproduction of this uh, in your system, and that's okay. why they even give eggs. What is found in your blood when 
another mosquito bites is the eggs of these parasites. Mm. So this tells about the reproduction of it. Oof. So chances of, um, say, somebody in the community is infected, so chances of the other community members being infected is pretty high if the mosquitoes are still roaming around hunting. Yes, and the best way to fight this disease is through uh, vector control. You can mm -hmm. say when we are able, if we are able to control the mosquitoes, then we have finished malaria. Okay, and that's the aim, right? Yeah, and that's the aim. Um, let's talk about the meds then. Um, the anti-malaria medication. How does it? How does it fight? Does it stop the spread of the parasite in your body? or does it just kind of boost your, your immunity? How does that work? Yeah, when you're given uh, uh, anti-malaria drugs, that means they're going to fight against uh, inf the, the parasites. That okay. means they're going to kill and clear the parasites from your body. And it's different from when uh, where you're boosting the immunity is another case. But when you're already infected, we are not do dealing with, we're not talking about a vaccine or Boosting the immunity, we are talking about clearing the infection, okay. and uh, sometimes uh, also uh, treating the symptoms, such as you can get anemia. So we have to treat these symptoms as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. The anti malaria are specifically for uh, going against the parasites that have infected you. Mm -hmm. So the aim is to clear the parasites from your body. Okay, and then the medication you take pre-infection. How does that stop? the infection of malaria. I, I guess that oh, would sorry? be called a vaccine, right? Uh, when you are, uh, can, can, you, can you repeat your question, please? Oh, so when you take the drugs, um, say for example, I was traveling to Zim, right? And so they were not sure which, mm -hmm. which area of Zim I was going to. So they said, okay, you need to take like malaria drugs so that you don't get infected. Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, 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 what? Yeah, now I get you. So what this does, the, when you're given the uh, the pre-drugs, you're given drugs before you are infected with malaria. Yeah. The aim of this is just like to to awaken your memory cells, or to build up a memory in your body system mm -hmm. that, like, uh, in your body there was already something, uh, some sort of malaria, uh, like building up a memory, like you are you are affected with malaria. So when the infection comes in. It is, it is going to be hard for it to infect you. So it's like boosting right. up your immune needs and giving, uh, giving the body the memory uh, to fight against malaria. So you so, are yeah. you're getting some antibodies, you're creating antibodies against the disease. Right, so it is some sort of a vaccine. Yeah, it's some sort of, I uh, can say that. Yeah, okay, cool. You see, I'm not good with these terms, but thanks for understanding. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. And you are involved in orphanages and, and, and elderly homes and stuff like that. What inspired you to, to take part in those organizations that focus in assisting um, in orphanages and adult or elderly homes? All right, so when, you know, living in a community where uh, you cannot access everything, and seeing that people cannot of can also not access everything, and especially it is more I can say more strange when people can cannot access the very important needs, the basic needs for their lives. It is really it really catches my attention seeing people not uh, being uh, sleeping without taking food, like sleeping hungry, seeing people having just a single pair of clothes every day at school because I went to a very local school, I used to see this, this situation in, in every place. Actually, I also come from a very, a very low-income family, mm -hmm. but at least maybe I could see my mother was able to ensure that at my primary level, I had at least two pairs of, of shorts and, and shirts to school and at least a sweater. But I could see many kids not having even a single sweater and they wait for someone else maybe to finish up the primary school and borrow and ask the big sweater from them, which is already torn. They just have to repair with uh, some pieces of um, just some some pieces of clothes. Mm -hmm. You find it with, with a lot up, of yeah. uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, stitched up. Uh, 
So uh, those things used to really hurt me. When I got chance to go to a good school later on, I went to a seminary and I started joining uh, some clubs, charity clubs, where we used to visit some orphans in a bit far places in uh, more rural areas. We found people um, who could not get their meals and some, some, uh, some children who had just left home, the parents have ran away. Some parents had died due to HIV AIDS uh, some of the parents had died from accidents and they were left alone. No one is helping them. So we find such we found such kids uh, in the hands of some good Samaritans, people trying to help them access the important needs. But still, these people cannot help all these kids with everything. So we started uh, our charity groups used to go visit them, give them at least uh, buy for them sugar, buy for them some clothes, buy for them some food in some days, sometimes having fun with them, just exposing them to other kind of life, like dancing, having some music, giving them a different kind of exercise books, uh, apart from which they are used to get from the donors, and trying to give them some good things, even a, a, a nice pencil. And that joy they used to get really inspired me to keep living these charity works. And when I joined university, before joining university, when I was in high school, I met this community which is doing more charities, not only in the orphanage centers, but also in prisoners. So I started working with them, going to the prisoners, to, to, going to the prisons, talking to the prisoners, inspiring them to, to not think that they are left behind by the community and uh, giving them the mindset that they can also be a change to the community. They are still needed by the community. Right. And there's, sometimes they'll get out of the prisons and start, they'll need to change and start saving the community in another way. Some of them are there by mistake. Maybe it's not them, it was not their fault. Maybe somebody else fault, but they were uh, they were given mistakes which were they didn't want they did not make them. Right, so sometimes right. they really need encouragement. Yeah, their mental health is really down. We need we need to boost up their mental health. Psychological, mm -hmm. they're not stable. So we need to speak to them. We need to encourage them. Then like reminding them that they are still human beings. Yeah. So yeah. this is what I do up to this moment. And every year, this is it's going to be a ninth year. Every Christmas on 25th December, we visit them, uh, have food with them, buy them some, some drinks, having some talks, singing with them, reminding that uh, for most of our Christians, we talk to them about Christ, talking to them the good news of God, that the, the Son of God has come, is going to be our Savior, is going to save us from a lot of things. They, they also have a lot of things to teach us because some of them are elders. Some mm -hmm. of them are learned, they went to school, even they have PhDs, some of them are masters wow. and degrees. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of things to tell us as well. They have a lot of lessons that they've learned when before they went to prison. So they share with us some of their stories. Yeah. And some of them need, need some help. So they, they have to get out of the prison, but they, they're lacking a very small support because relatives have left them behind. Mm -hmm. So we have to become their relatives and help them get out of there. Yeah. And who yeah. are the um who are the prisoners that have kind of stood out for you that you've had like a one-on-one -on -one interaction and like what is like who are they and what is their story and why are they there? You don't have to name job, you can just mm, okay. I can talk about one. In 2018, when I visited the prisoners, uh I think it's for it was for like my fifth time. I spoke to the head of the prison, the policeman who heads the prison and she gave me a story about one old man who was 72 years old, poor man, who had been there for one year waiting for, I don't know how to call it, waiting for a judgment, was not actually in prison. There's a, a phase between getting to prison and before your judgment is passed from the, from the court. So I had stayed there for one year and then after a year, he was I guess, sentenced for one year. Was uh, was prisoned for one year. Or, or was supposed to stay in the prison for one more year, but this old man used to uh, like every day used to cry, like complaining. I'm just here by mistake and whatever. So I asked him if we uh, if we could give me a chance to talk to him, and I was with other friends, colleagues from where we went there. We called the man, we spoke to him, and he told us his story how he got to the prison at 72 years old, very mm -hmm. weak looking very unhealthy and he told us that he was picking some firewoods from the nearby the uh, nearby the the forest which is not allowed it is not allowed to pick uh, anything from the forest 
it's, it's a mistake. It's a criminal. Uh, it's a criminal. They will pick um, like firewood or cut trees from the forest. But himself told us that he was not cutting anything. Mm -hmm. He was only picking those uh, pieces of firewoods which had fallen opposite the forest. Right. And unfortunately, he was caught and he was charged. And he had no, he had no any advocate, any person to advocate for him. He had no one to talk about to help him even explain himself. So he was charged. He was supposed to pay three hundred thousand Tanzanian shillings almost equivalent to 150 USD. But he failed to pay that, the yeah. penalty. So he had to stay there for uh, almost a year before his the judgment was passed that he should be imprison imprisoned for one year. Mm. And after that one year, when uh, the judgment was passed that he had to be imprisoned for one year, again, he was charged twice the amount. So he had to pay six and in order to get out of that. But he couldn't pay and no one could help him. So we had to, to talk to him and ask him about his family. He told us that he had four kids, but all kids traveled, moved from the village and went to the towns. No one even remembers them at home. So he only lives with, uh, with his wife and he has to find food for the house. And they also have a, grand, a grandson and a granddaughter, one of their children. One of their child uh, brought their kids at home, the grandchild then. He brought them at home, then he left not he doesn't even care about his kids so as a grandfather he has to care for the grands uh, the grandson and the granddaughter so he had no way than just picking some files going to sell to, to people and and sometimes exchanging it with food from people so that he could feed the family mm. so when he explained that it was really painful and we had to fundraise from twitter from other friends in the community and we got him out it was really touching oh, when he man. just Mm -hmm. When he was just given a notice that he had to get out of the prison in just a week after we had talked to him, he was almost forgetting a door to come out, almost knocking his, his head at the wall. So I felt that joy that he had. And this is really a memorial story to me from the prisoners. Yeah. And so did you guys mm -hmm. take him home to his wife and grandkids? Yes, we picked him from there. And one of the neighbors came along to town uh, to escort him to home. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, we had excess contributions we made. We gave it to him so that he could uh, proceed. Yeah. Are you still in contact in contact with him? Uh, one of our members is still doing a visit, a home visit to that place. Yeah. And and how are they? Uh, currently, I'm not updated, so I can't speak anything. So unless I I do follow up, and maybe I can know more yeah. about him. How is he? Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, so how do people support your organizations? They they just have to find you online and, you know, click on the donation tab and stuff like that. How does it work? So the organization uh, is bigger and it's a community based in the church. So we have the headquarters in Rome and we have the branches in almost 70 countries. So. In our branch, we have a bank account. We fundraise through churches. We go to the churches, we announce, we give them a bank account. Like now we are fundraising for the Christmas lunch with the poor, the children, orphans, the elders who are beggars in the streets and many other who are also the children in some pediatric wards at the hospital who, don't, who doesn't have help. Some mothers are left alone. The fathers have just left the old burden of the kids to them especially the kids who have cancer, yeah, they really have a big uh, burden of, on the treatment issues. So we really have to give them at least a comfort, at least even once per year, it's really helpful. And sometimes you also have to do visits more and more. So we do fundraising through our members, community members, friends. We do have some cards. We give cards to our friends to fundraise as well. Yeah. So that's how we do it. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Sorry, I'm just I'm just coming down from that story that you told me. Yeah, it's fair. And and now other than Kilimanjaro, which is in Tanzania, right? Yes. Yeah, I know something. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> other than Kilimanjaro, hey what, is, what is Tanzania known for? I can say Tanzania is really a beautiful country and I really enjoy living here. 
one of the biggest uh, attractive centers, as I told you, is Kil- Mount Kilimanjaro. Mm-hmm. Apart from that, we have a, a big national parks like Serengeti, Ngorongoro, Manyara. We have the very, bit, uh, very good, uh, big crater. I think it's one of the top in the world, Ngorongoro Crater. It's a very beautiful area. Uh, we also have uh, Tanzanite mines, only found in Tanzania, the Tanzanite. Yeah, so those are a few things I could just mention. But I think we are good Swahili speakers. So when you come to Tanzania, <laughs> you can really enjoy the Swahili. <laughs> and we have a lot of uh, tribes as well, but you cannot distinguish people by their tribes easily. But we have the Maasai, which can easily be known because of their dress. They are really good people, fun, can have a lot of dances, traditional right. dances. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And which <laughs> tribe do you belong to? I belong to Chaga tribe. Uh huh. And what is yeah, your tribe? Love uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and South of Tanzania. You are not uh, people sure. People do joke with us that uh, people do joke with us that like we are good in these it's like making money, you know. Ah, cool. <laughs> oh, that's a joke. <laughs> that's a joke. So in Chaga land, that's where the mount that the mountain is formed. Mm-hmm. Kimanjaro, but we also have a lot of memories from our ancestors. We have the the caves, a lot of caves are around the or the traditional caves where the elders used to to keep their kettles during wars, hiding their families. So there's some very beautiful caves, historical caves around the uh, the Chagaland. But also we are good in uh, uh, farming with uh, banana and uh, and coffee. Mm-hmm. Okay. Have you ever yeah. been up Kilimanjaro? Yeah. I've not been to the top, but I've been to the fastest top of the mountain. Huh. And how is that? Just climbing to the fastest top. It's very beautiful. Very nice. Yeah, it's a very people, nice experience. Yeah, people travel from all across the world to go, you know, see so, Mount yeah. Kilimanjaro. Yeah, yeah. It's quite fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, that was on my list at some point. Um, you know, I would like to come visit. But then COVID happened. Yeah, you're and- really welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Well, COVID happened, yeah. you know, the travel restrictions. And obviously, economically, it yeah. kind of doesn't make sense to travel right now and all of that. Yes, I understand. Yeah. And what do you know about South Africa? Is, is South Africa like a, a popular country? you know, amongst the horn, Tanzanians. Call it the Horn of Africa something. Yes. Yeah. So do you guys talk about it? Because I remember I had a friend, Lidunda, Lidunda Moyo, I think that's his name. He's also from Tanzania. So he graduated from the University of Cape Town and moved back to South Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some people stay. Some people wow. stay in like Johannesburg and Cape Town and they build their lives there. But, you know, he's one of the few people that I know that kind of went back home, um, yeah, which wow. is, yeah, which is where you are. Yeah. So, yeah. What do you guys say about South Africans? I'm curious. <laughs> no, you know, no, I also do business. Uh-huh. So I can sell. I do business, uh, medical supply business. I supply some of the consumables in the uh, in the hospitals and laboratories and for uh, medical students. So for myself, I know South Africa is a good place, good marketplace for purchasing uh, medical things. Okay. And uh, it's a place where you can find a lot of genuine things. Yeah. That's, That's about a it. few things I know because I have some friends who also live there uh-huh. yeah, in South Africa. Yeah, so this. That's about uh, it. Yeah. A good thing I can talk about uh, South Africans. Right. But as sometimes I was worried uh, when I had some things of xenophobia. You know, oh, it yeah. Was really yeah. Yeah. But, mm, yeah. 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 Africans fighting Africans. It's really. It's heartbreaking. Uh, worrisome. Yeah, yeah. Heartbreaking, really. Yeah. Mm. I saw you post um, advertising scrubs. I guess that's when I learned that you also sell, you know, medical equipment and attire and stuff like that um yeah 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 so I guess you can send me the link later and I'll just put in the description box for people in Tanzania that are looking for such things okay thank you right what else would you like to talk about I'm out of questions 
Yeah, a lot of questions. <laughs> um, maybe talking about the, the art of multitasking, you know, I do a lot of things, you know. Someone could be wondering, like, this man is a chairperson of the Youth Advisory Council. This man is a general manager for his okay. business. He's a country coordinator for the World Youth Summit, for the Next Generation Global Security. Again, doing things with the charity. Yeah. Uh, sometimes also fun. Doing How farming. do you do it? Uh, Let's talk about that, the art of multitasking. How do you do it? Where do you yeah, find the so, time in 24 hours? do all of that it's really it's really tiresome to do a lot of things like doing a lot of work sometimes you might be missing some things or doing some things not complete but at least uh, when you learn to sort things and prioritize things you can really things can really work out for mm. instance you just know like today i'll be having an interview with uh, palesa for one hour and i really have to give it time i really have to get prepared for it uh, then you know from that I have some time to to rest and have my lunch and everything, mm -hmm. and maybe during lunch I'll be watching this thing before I have to make a summary of this uh, a minute. Maybe a, a conference was done and it was recorded. I have to make a summary of it as a country coordinator. So when I'm eating, maybe I, I'm displaying it in front of me. From yeah. there, I have some minutes to write and review after now. Then I have some time to rest, some time to meet, chat with my friends. And again, just having a schedule of everything that you have to do. Like, I can, I have to do this and this and this. And a good thing is when you love doing something. For instance, when I, have, when I get a job to do about around malaria, I, I don't even think twice about accepting <laughs> it because it's an area of interest. You know, when I'm doing it, I have joy with it. When right. I hear something about uh, global health, public health, those are things really hits with me. So yeah. I won't go too much out of, uh, I won't diverge much out of my professionalism and the, uh, the areas of interest, unless there is a really strong reason. For instance, you know, as young people, we need money. You know, we need yeah. financial confidence. We need to, uh, to build financial confidence. So when I see an opportunity which, I can do, it's out of my profession, but still I can do. And I think I can give time for it. I make sure that it, it won't affect, for instance, my internship. And maybe I can spare some time from doing my internship and ask me for a permission for this week to do this work. And mm -hmm. it is really profitable for me. Then I do it. Yeah. And later on, I know I have five days to, to, uh, to cover for my internship works, which we're missing. So yeah. I really find out Okay, sometimes I have to balance these things. But the most important thing is about mental health because sometimes you can receive a work from uh, you, the council, you receive a work from the summit, you receive a work from the network, the global... <laughs> all at security. the same time. Three works and all of them have almost uh, uh, same deadlines. Maybe by 14th, uh, by 14th noon, by 14th night, by 15th. This works all have to be submitted. So yeah. sometimes you learn to delegate things. You delegate things. In the council, I have the secretaries. I have the... So when you are doing a lot of works, make sure you know teams of people who can do similar things that you're doing. So sometimes right. you delegate. You, know, you have an opportunity and you can't do it, uh, work on it effectively, give it out to your friend. And that will also help build and strengthen your network and yeah, friendship yeah. as well. Um, also, yeah, so I have a question. You are obviously a leader of like all of these organizations, right? How, what is the struggle when it comes to leading people? What are the challenges that um, you faced? Yeah, you know, leading people is really difficult. You know, we are, we, we are different and, and our differences really differ. So mm -hmm. people have different behaviors. People have different perceptions with things. Maybe you can tell someone do this and it feels like, why are you commanding me? And another person yeah. will tell them do this and it feels like, wow, I'm valued. Yeah. So we, as a leader, I do meet such people. You tell them do this and it feels like you have commanded me and mm -hmm. maybe I won't do it or just to let you yeah. know, like I'm also a man like you, you know, mm -hmm. to let you know, like uh, I'm also a big leader. I'm also a strong person and whatever. Some, there are some people of that nature. But then some people are very humble. Sometimes you give them work, you tell them do this, and they feel like 
uh, it's because you see me humble, that's, uh, that's why you're giving me too much work. So dealing with these people really needs understanding about each other. You know, this person is a person of who loves to do works and understanding their interests as well. You know, this person is a good person. When you give them a uh, good, maybe a work on communications, they really enjoy doing it. And when you have anything about communication, you give them because they yeah. feel like you are helping them also improve themselves. Right, and grow. You have a yeah. work maybe about sports and career guidance and someone loves to do that, you delegate it to them. They feel valued and they feel uh, empowered about their right. work. Right. So in my things, what I do is letting people do the things they really love to do. <laughs> don't, like I don't force uh, people to do things that they don't feel like doing. So sometimes I, you can get some works which uh, you cannot handle at the time but uh, there are people who are interested about doing them. So even if I was to do them myself, giving them, it uh, it's even strengthens our bond and keeps our team more stronger. Yeah. And yeah. probably keeps things more effective, work more uh, precisely than doing it when I'm already stressed with other works and so on. Yeah. Who inspires yeah. you? Like, who's the one person that you look up to? You know, when when they're in the element, you just go like, okay, you know what? Someday I just kind of want to be like this person. Well, not exactly, but they just kind of push you to want to be a better version of yourself. Yeah, I really look at a lot of uh, great leaders doing a lot of great things. Right. Like my own uh, first president, Jakaya Kikwete, uh, the former president of Tanzania, really inspires me with how he deals with people, how he responds to situations. But also, I'm very inspired with Barack Obama, with his leadership, the way he organizes, the way he talks, public speaking, the way he talks, the way he can convince, yeah, and many other people, especially in the area of public health, like the currently Director General, WHO. I really, he really inspires me with how he has been dealing with the COVID-19 situation, the, the stones we throw on a team, how he, re how he receives them and builds on them. Uh, the way he gives feedback about things, the way he talks, you know. Yeah. yeah. As a public health enthusiast, that uh, those are people who really inspires me to keep doing, and maybe one day become like them or even more. I'm sure you will. I mean, I, I'm just happy that you started early. You know, you found out what you want to do with your life earlier, and so I think you're doing mm -hmm. an amazing mm -hmm. job, and and I'm proud of you for that. Thank you very much. I'm proud of what you're doing as well. What am I doing? <laughs> you know what you're doing. <laughs> you're doing great things, inspiring young people, connecting young people. You know, yeah. this is a very important thing for us young people to connect to each other, to learn about each other, to support each other. You know, the future, when we are, we are talking about the next generation, the next generation is us ourselves. Yeah. We are growing. We are the current generation and we are the next as well. We are going to take up these uh, leadership roles globally and regionally and country, uh, nationally. Uh, if we cannot keep along, talk to each other, understand each other, I'm a Tanzanian, you're a South African. When, it come, when we come along, we should learn that we, sh we don't have to live like different people. Mm. You know, we, we, we will build up uh, the spirit of union, the spirit of love, the spirit of working together. We can build it this earlier. So having people like you is really important and it yeah. really inspires me and gives me a good foresight of what's going to come in the future so i can say the future is really exciting <laughs> having people like you thank you thanks mm -hmm. for saying that and and just to add on what you just said i think like the generation that comes after us is also looking at us and they're going to take over you know whatever we're doing so at least we should try make sure that we give them a better head start than what we got you know yeah so yeah, yeah, so, yeah yeah so that's the vision and and um yeah slowly but surely we, we're gonna get to where we're going oh, yeah. I'm so proud mm, absolutely. yeah I'm so proud that as a nation as well you know there's people who are doing something um that will benefit the world you know um instead of just wasting time absolutely yeah so it it all begins with us it begins with me it begins with you <laughs> <laughs>